was the first time I've seen that one. Please silence your phone. Okay, that's good. Well, welcome to our service this morning. Thank you for joining us in person and online. And uh, we trust that you will be uh, encouraged today as we meet together to worship. Uh, just one announcement that I want to highlight in your bulletin, and that is on the first page, bottom of the page, Christmas cheer time. I didn't write it. He wrote it. Okay, so don't... Sandra's... The... <laughs> Anybody else want to take blame? <laughs> no? Okay, so Christmas cheer. All right. I understand we're in August, but it's the way it is. Um, so allow me to read it now. It says, for the month of September, we will be collecting financial gifts or Walmart gift cards for our Christmas families. We will do the same as last year. And it's a good thing you tell us because we wouldn't remember. Um, gift cards will be put in food bank boxes. We were able to bless 10 families last year and uh, see Sandra, Pastor Paul. If you do send an e-transfer, please put Christmas in the message. Okay, clear as can be. And thank you for allowing me to talk about Christmas on the 20th of August. Well, as we come together to worship, I just want to read these three verses to you from Psalm 145. David writes this. He said, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. Hymn number 347. 347 and can it be? Words will also be on the screen. Let's stand as we sing, please, if you are able.
Thank you so much. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you all this morning. Let's just start with a word of prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, again, we do thank you and praise you for who you are. And Lord, we do thank you for your amazing love that you have towards us. You are a God who is love. And Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your only begotten son into this world to live here, to die here, to pay the penalty and punishment for our sin. And Lord, because of that, we love you. And Lord, we just thank you that your love is an unconditional love, that your love is a sacrificial love. It's actually kind of crazy love that you have for us, that you loved us while we were still sinners, enemies, haters of you. So we thank you for, for proving your love to us by sending your son. And Father, we thank you that we could be here this morning as brothers and sisters in Christ, those who love you, those who want to serve you, those who want to grow in the knowledge and faith of Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we just ask that you would bless each one that's here this morning. You would bless each one that's listening online today. Just encourage us. Meet whatever needs that we may have. Lord, we all have different needs. Um, we have financial needs, emotional needs, physical, spiritual, mental. Lord, we just ask that you'd meet each and every one of us where we are. And Lord, we're here to glorify you, to worship you. It's not about us. It's all about you. There are many people on our list um, who need our prayers, and you know who they are. Um, I think of Kevin um, this morning, who's battling pneumonia. Lord, we just pray that you would put your healing hand upon him, that he would find it easier to breathe. He'd be able to move around better without losing his breath. So just touch his body, Father. Lord, we also think of uh, our brother Bruce. We thank you that he's here with us, he and Kathy, Lord. Uh, just bless them, continue to work in their lives. Uh, just help them along physically, Father. We think of Dorothy Sears, Lord. We just continue to pray for her and the health issues she's battling. And Pauline and Terry, Lord, Lord. Uh, we just bring them before your throne of grace, Father, and so many others. We bring them before you this morning asking that you would do a miracle physically in their lives. But more importantly, we pray for those who don't know you. They need spiritual healing. And Lord, we just pray that they would hear the gospel, that they would remember what they heard from other people, and your Holy Spirit would work in their hearts and their minds and convince them of their need to ask Jesus to be their Lord and Savior. Lord, we think of our family and friends of the Drew, Lord, we love them so much. And Lord, we just ask your blessing on them, that you would keep them healthy, you'd keep them safe from accidents, you'd just continue to bless them and encourage them and show yourself to them. Again, we pray for the staff of all the nursing homes in our area, Father. We thank you for them. Continue to bless them and keep them healthy as well. And Lord, we think of those who may be mourning the loss of a loved one. Lord, we just pray for them that they would feel your presence even today, that you would wrap your loving arms around them and comfort them and encourage them, and that we as your people would also be there for them, just to encourage them as well and to comfort them. Lord, we continue to think of those churches in our area and those around that we know who are looking for pastors. Lord, the need is great in many places. And Lord, we just pray that you would be preparing the man that you have for these places. And you would bring him with his family, if he has one, or by himself, to these places to minister with them, to serve them well, and that they could serve their communities well. So Lord, we just ask that you would fill these positions. And we do thank you for the men of God who are filling in the gap until you bring these men there. Bless them, encourage them as well. Lord, we ask that you would revive us. Lord, we need a revival in our land, and it begins with us as your people. Lord, your word tells us, I know it's written to Israel, but it could be applied to us as well, 
if we would just humble ourselves and pray and seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, then you would hear us, forgive us, and heal our land. So Lord, stir up that fire inside each and every one of us. May we be set on fire for you. May we continue to have a thirst for the things of God and the word of God. And Lord, we do pray, it seems early, but we do pray for our children, young people, and college kids who will be going back to school in the next couple of weeks. Lord, we just pray for them, that you would just, just be with them. You would guide them and direct them and protect them from any teaching that is false or contrary to your word. And Lord, we thank you that some of our schools have Christian teachers. Bless them, encourage them, and may they serve you well in our education system. So Father, as I said, there's so many other things that we can pray for. Uh, we do bring them before you this morning. We do thank you for your goodness to us. And Lord, we just ask that you would continue to bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we read our scripture this morning. And we're all going to be involved. I'm going to read the first slide. You guys can read the second, and I'll read the third and back and forth as we read Hebrews chapter 12, starting at verse 5 through 13. You can look in your Bible or you can look on the screen. So let's stand if you are able. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5 says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we give them or gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. And make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, and let it rather be healed. This is the word of God. Let's take a few moments to... Just greet one another in love. Again, if you don't want to be shaken or hugged, put out your elbow. making your way back to your seat, I'm going to ask our ladies trio to come and minister to us this morning in music.
ladies very much. Appreciate that. Well, let's pray together. Father God, we are so thankful for the love that you showed to us in sending your son Jesus to come to this earth to die, that we might have everlasting life. Forgiveness of sin, everlasting life, and a home with you. We just thank you for these things, Father. We thank you for your goodness to us and how you provide for us day after day after day. Um, Father, we are not lacking, and uh, we just thank you so much for how you have provided for our church family here and your faithfulness over the years. We thank you, Father, for your love, for your peace, for your mercy, for your grace that is extended to us moment by moment by moment. Father, we thank you that you love us so much and you have shown us in so many ways. And we pray, Father, that as we continue in our worship service this morning, as we hear your word preached, taught, that, Father, you would just touch our hearts by your spirit. Just help us to learn what we need to learn this morning. And we commit Pastor Paul to you. Continue to guide us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hymn number 348, please. 348. I'll let you remain seated for this one.
Amen. Aren't we thankful for his love? If you have your Bibles, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And we've been looking at a few divine resources that the writer of Hebrews gives us or gave to the Jewish folks back then, but they could also be applied to us as well. So some resources that should encourage us if we're going through some situation that gets difficult. Anybody have any difficult situations going on in their life or any difficult situations going, in, going on around the world? There's a lot of difficult situations going on. And here, the writer of Hebrews is giving us not just some resources, but divine resources. That makes a big difference. Divine resources that are pointed out to encourage us as we go through different situations of difficulty. And last week, we looked at the first one, and it was the example of the Son of God. In verses 1 through 4, we spent actually two weeks looking at these verses, we looked quickly, we took a peek at the great cloud of witnesses and the example that they have for us. Then we took a quick peek at ourselves, and seeing that we are in this race, we need to run this race with endurance, but we also need to lay aside every weight and the sin. We looked at the sin of unbelief that so, that's so easily besets us or ensnares us. So we need to set those things aside. And then we took the time to look at Jesus. We didn't just take a peek. We took a long look at Jesus, and we came to this conclusion. We must keep our eyes fixed on him and not on the things that are going around around us, but fix our eyes on him. It says, looking onto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So keep your eyes focused on him. Grab a hold of Jesus and never let him go is what we need to do. Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. And we're running this race, and the author wrote, let us run. So he was running. The cloud of witnesses were running. And I believe Jesus himself is even with us as we're enduring this race of life. Because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So if we're running this race, he's right by our side. So we looked at, looked at Jesus. Don't let him go. And before we move on to our next divine resource for encouragement, I just want to focus a little bit more on verse 3 and 4. It says this, For consider him. So what are we to do? We're to consider him. The writer was telling these, these Jewish believers, Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself or hostility lest ye be weary and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. So consider him who endured all this hostility from people around him, from sinners. They were against him, weren't they? Even in their difficult times, and even in our difficult times, if we would consider Jesus, we would be encouraged and not discouraged. So the writer is saying, I understand 
you're, you're getting discouraged. I understand there's persecution starting coming your way. I understand all that. But look to Jesus. Consider Jesus. Fix your eyes on him for your encouragement. Consider him. You're following in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. Consider him. Look at him. Paul wrote in Romans 8, 17, If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So if we're going to suffer with him, we're going to be glorified together. Isn't that great news? That should encourage us. I'm suffering for his name's sake. I'm going to be glorified together with him. Think of all the hostility that Jesus went through or he endured from sinners. At his own synagogue in Nazareth, they wanted to kill him. Can you imagine coming to church every Sunday here at Salem? Coming here and you're thinking, oh, all these people want to kill me. Would you come? I wouldn't. But Jesus endured that. He knew that the people in town wanted to kill him. The religious leaders constantly tried to trap him and trip him up and embarrass him. We looked at that in, in Luke. Constantly, one day after another. They lied about Jesus, saying he was a drunkard and a glutton. He was betrayed by one of his own disciples. He was mocked and beaten by many. His own people cried out against him, Crucify him! Crucify him! He endured the hostility of the people. And then the writer goes on and says, Lest ye be wearied and faint in your mind. We need to know this. That Jesus doesn't ask any more of us than what he himself has experienced. He doesn't ask us to do more than what he did. And that he knows exactly what we are going through. So consider Jesus, he says, because he knows what you're going through. He knows what you're going through. And when you consider him, this will keep you from becoming weary this will keep you from becoming discouraged in your souls. So consider Jesus, he says. And then he goes on and says, Ye have not yet resisted on the blood, striving against sin. These Jewish believers, you know, they were discouraged. And we get discouraged sometimes, don't we? We get discouraged. They were starting to experience significant social and economic persecution. But they didn't get to the point where they shed their blood. Jesus shed his blood. They didn't get to that point. What this verse simply means is, at that time, the temple was not destroyed. They could see it. Many of them wanted to go back and be part of it again. The persecution from the Gentiles in the Roman Empire was just starting to, to build. So he's saying, in the midst of all this, consider Jesus, folks. Fix your eyes on him. Don't let him go. Don't turn from him. Remember what he endured for you on the cross. He endured it all. Although you are having a very difficult time, you have problems in your life, you have troubles in your life, do you know what the only cure for their weakness and our weakness is? For our weariness 
for all our falterings, for our failings, our stumblings, our discouragement. Do you know what the solution to that is? Read the screen. Consider Jesus. Keep your eyes fixed on him. That reminded me of a wonderful song. We sing it here often. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. So consider Jesus. We have difficult times. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Turn your eyes on him. And I love that part. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim. It's like they'll fade into the background because all that matters is Jesus. That's all that matters is him. So the encouragement that the writer gives, the first one, is consider him. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith, and you will not be discouraged, and you will not want to quit. Let's look at the second resource, divine resource to encourage the believer. It's the assurance of the love of God. Aren't you glad that God loves you? Amen. The songs that we sang this morning were all geared towards the love that God has for us. Amazing love. How can it be? How can it be? And the ladies and my dear wife didn't know what I was preaching on this morning, and they even picked a song about God's love. If that wasn't love, he loves us. So that's the second encouragement when we're discouraged and feeling want to quit, just remember, God loves you. And God loves me. This is a section of Hebrews that a lot of people don't like to talk about. They sort of skip over it. Because we're going to look at the discipline of the Lord or the chastening of the Lord. And the key word in this section is chastening. Discipline. And what it means in the Greek is simply this. Child training, instruction, education, discipline. That's what it means. And the writer viewed the trials of these Christians as a spiritual discipline that could help them and help us mature. And isn't that the goal, or shouldn't, be, shouldn't that be the goal of all of us, that we want to mature as Christians, we don't want to be babes in Christ forever. And the writer of Hebrews talks about that. He talks about how we need strong meat now. And that's what he's given us, strong meat, so that we can mature in Christ. So the chastening of the Lord, or the discipline of the Lord, or the instructions of the Lord, they are to help us to mature in our Christian life or in our Christian faith. Instead of trying to escape the difficulties of life, we should rather, as verse 11 told us when we read this morning, be exercised by them so that we can grow. Over these last several years, I have seen spiritual growth in the folks here. I've seen you guys grow spiritually. And that's because you're in the Word. You're praying. We're loving each other. We need to grow in our faith. Can you imagine if your 35-year-old son was still acting like a two-year-old and was still the size of a two-year-old? He didn't grow in anything but age. That's not right, is it? That's not natural. Our children grow, and hopefully at some point they mature into productive adults. And that's what God wants of us, that we would grow as mature Christians who would be productive in our society. 
That's what he wants. He wants us to grow. When we are suffering, it's easy to think, oh, God doesn't love me, isn't it? When we have a struggle going on in life, a difficulty going on in life, we, we could easily think, oh, why me, God? Why don't you love me anymore? You're letting me go through this or that. Why don't you love me? When we go through discipline or instruction of the Lord, that proves that he loves us. It proves that he loves you and he loves me. And here, the writer in this section, verses 5 to 13, he gives us proof that chastening of the Lord comes from the heart of God. Because he loves us. He loves us. And the first proof that we have is this. The word of God. We have the word of God right here in our hands. Some have a paper version. Some have electronic version. But we have the word of God in our hands. And that's one of the proofs that the chastening of the Lord comes from the heart of love. He loves you and he loves me. Look at verse 5 and 6. And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourges every son whom he receiveth. We even see right here in these verses, right here in the word of God, that the Lord loves those that he chastens. The Lord loves those that he disciplines. He loves you. He loves me. This section of verses, these two verses, is a quotation from, from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 11 and 12 a statement that had been known by these Jewish believers, but it seems like they forgot it. It seems like they forgot it. And does that happen to us sometimes? We know something that God says, but sometimes we forget it. We forget it. This is one of the sad consequences of getting dull towards the Word of God. If you remember way back in chapter 5, well, that must have been a good year and a half ago, that we talked about the, the writer giving warnings concerning the Word of God, and the first was becoming dull to the Word of God. And when we become dull to the Word of God, we can forget what the Word of God says. So some of these folks were becoming dull to the Word. They forgot that the Word said, the Lord chastens those whom he loves. They've forgotten that. This quotation is an exhortation, which really means it's an encouragement. So it should encourage them, it should encourage us, knowing that because God loves us, when we go astray and do something we shouldn't do, he's going to discipline us. He's going to try to bring us back to himself and have that fellowship with him that he wants. So it's an encouragement. This is meant to be an encouragement. But because they have forgotten the word of God, they lost their encouragement. And they were getting ready to give up. They were getting ready to go back to the temple and all the rituals and everything else. One of the great reasons that these folks were discouraged was because they saw no need of why God would allow them to go through difficult times. Why would God allow me to go through difficult times? They forgot the principle of the chastening of the Lord. They were ready to turn their backs on Jesus. They had to be encouraged. Look at Jesus. Consider him. 
They were ready to turn their back and walk away. So the Lord chastens, disciplines, instructs those whom he loves. That's why they were going through difficult times. And that's why we go through difficult times and difficult situations at times. Sometimes we need discipline. We need instruction from the Lord. Much difficulty in the Christian life comes from three words. You have forgotten. We have forgotten what the Word of God says. Perhaps it's some principle that we have forgotten. We remember it in our mind, but we forgot it in our heart. We forgot it in our heart. And folks, we must remember it again. These folks needed to remember the Lord chastens those whom he loves. In times of trials and stress, I know none of us have trials or stress in our life, but for those that do, no, we all have times of trials and stress. Sometimes when we're going through these things, we forget some of the basics, don't we? Sometimes, just like these Hebrew folks, they seriously wonder, is God really in control? Does God really love me? These thoughts start creeping in, don't they? If God really loved me, he wouldn't allow me to go through this or that or the other thing. We must admit that God does allow everything that happens. He allows everything that happens. So he must at least passively approve of it because he certainly has the power to stop it, doesn't he? He does. Of course, God is not the author of evil, but he allows people to make evil choices. He does that. And through those choices, he can work out his ultimately good purpose. He can do that. Even if only to demonstrate his justice and righteousness in contrast to evil. He allows these things to happen. He allows discipline to happen because he what? He loves us. There's some key words in this quotation from Proverbs chapter 3, which we read here in Hebrews 12, 5, and 6. And we see the words son, children, and sons. Son, children, and sons. These words are used six times just in, in verses 5 through 8. And they refer to adult sons not as little children. So when we see the word children in verse 5, it should be sons. Throughout Scripture, God portrays himself as a father, doesn't he? He portrays himself as a father. And those who receive Jesus as their Savior are his Children, we looked at this Wednesday night. The world and even some churches today teach that we are all the children of God. That's not true. We are all created in the image of God, yes, but we are not all the children of God. The only way that a person can become a child of God, a son or daughter of God, is to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's the only way. Let's jump back to uh, John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 12. John 1, verse 12. It says, But as many as received him, received who? Jesus. To them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. 
So the only way that we can be a son of God or a daughter of God is to believe on his name, is to believe in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. Galatians 3, 26. For ye are all the children of God, the verse doesn't stop there, by faith in Jesus Christ. So how are we all the children of God? By faith in Jesus Christ. You put your faith in Jesus Christ, you become a child or daughter of God. No other way. No other way. Why does God use the analogy of father and son or daughter? Because that's something we understand. We understand the father-son relationship, don't we? Or the father-daughter relationship. He uses this al analogy because it's something that the people understand, the father and son relationship. He compares himself to a loving father who not only blesses his children, but disciplines his children for their own good. He doesn't do it because he's a bully. He chastens us. He disciplines us. He educates us for our own good. Hebrews chapter 12 goes on to show that those who do not receive the children, or receive God's discipline, are not legitimate children. A loving father carefully watches their children, don't they? A loving father carefully watches their children, and when their son or daughter defies his orders and heads for danger, the father disciplines them, or educates them, instructs them. Why does he do it? To keep them safe. We discipline our children to keep them safe, to keep them from harm. And that's what God does with us. We love our children. We don't want to see them get hurt. So when they head for something that's going to hurt them, we discipline them. We instruct them. When a born-again child of God heads for sin, or we refuse to resist temptation, our Heavenly Father steps in, and He brings chastening into our life. Why? to direct us back to holiness, to direct us back to the way that we should be living that would bring honor and glory to him. Chastening can come in many forms. It could come in the form of guilty feelings. Ever have that? When you're doing something you know you shouldn't be doing, you just have this guilty feeling in your head. That's one way that God chastens us. Another way is through unpleasant circumstances. And if we still resist to obey him and still want to go on our own way, sometimes there's a loss of peace in our life. We never lose peace with God, but we can lose the peace of God. We can. Sometimes relationships fracture, don't they? They do. There can be any number of, uh, of negative consequences for choosing sin. And sometimes, as we read in Hebrew, uh, 1 Corinthians sorry, 11, verse 30, sometimes the Lord can bring physical illness, 
and sometimes even death. Even death, so that his child wouldn't continue to stray and ruin their testimony more and ruin the name of Christ. Sometimes death is even involved. A parent who repeatedly disciplines an infant child they would be considered a monster, wouldn't they? If they continually, day in, day out, for no reason, discipline their children, they would be considered a monster. But God doesn't deal with us as if we were little infants. He deals with us as adult sons and daughters because we have been adopted into his family and we are given an adult standing in his family. Let's go to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 14. Romans chapter 8, starting at verse 14. <clears throat> For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, so if, or if so be, that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And over to Galatians chapter 4. So here we see, if we have the Spirit, we are the children of God. And in Galatians chapter 4, starting at verse 1, and Romans told us we're also heirs of Christ, with Christ. It says now, uh, Galatians 4, 1, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all, but is under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the Father. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because you are sons, God has set forth the spirit of his son into your heart, saying, Abba, Father, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We're not children, because children are just like the servants. They're under the governor, the tutors, and everything else. But God treats us now as a mature adult son or daughter in him. And the fact that the Father chastens us is proof that we're maturing. It's proof that you and I are maturing in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I trust we all want to continue to mature. As long as we're on planet Earth, there's more for us to learn. We will never know all of the Bible. We never will until we get to glory. And then I still believe, just like the Amazing Grace songs, when we've been there 10,000 years, we still won't understand everything. But we need to continue to mature in the Lord. The quotation from Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 reminds us that God's chastening should never be taken as a sign of his rejection. 
He's not rejecting us when he chastens us. Rather, it's a sign of him treating us as his children, as his son or daughter. So next time we're going through something, we could have this attitude. Thank you, God, for treating me like your child. Thank you, God, for allowing me to go through this because I know you're with me because I got my eyes fixed on you. I'm not looking anywhere else. I'm looking onto Jesus, and I know that when I'm going through this, that you are there with me, maturing me, and building me the way that you want me to be. He's not done with us yet. I think it's Philippians that says he's still working on us. Be confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will continue it until the day of perfection. He will continue it. He's still working on you, and he's still working on me. Only the proudest Christian would claim that they never need correction from God. Only the proudest Christian would say that. But folks, no one is above his training. No one is above his chastening. Often people ask, is God punishing me for wrong choices in the past? Is God punishing me for things that I've done in the past? What should our answer be? Our answer should be this. All our punishment for sin was exhausted upon Jesus on the cross. All of our punishment of sin has been put on Him. The wrath of God was poured out on him because he was carrying our sin, not his own. The wrath of God was poured out on him so that those who are in Christ, that would be us, no wrath remains. No wrath remains. So is God punishing me for sin of my past? No, because that's been dealt with at the cross. And Romans chapter 8, verse 1, we all know this verse. There is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. There's none. No wrath remains. It's been dealt with on the cross. Never to be brought up again. When we give our lives to Christ, our substitute for sin... Our sin is forgiven, and God remembers it no more. Go back to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 8, and I'll finish up with this. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. And over to chapter 10, starting at verse 15. Hebrews 10, 15. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. When we give our lives to Christ, our sin is forgiven and never thrown in our face again. God remembers it no more. However, often our wrong choices that we made in the past, they might have some unpleasant consequences now, right? They, we might have some consequences now. God doesn't necessarily remove all the natural consequences of sin when we repent. 
But those consequences are sometimes tools that he uses to teach us. Tools that he uses to prevent us from repeating the same thing again. And it also reminds us of God's grace. He forgave us our sin and remembers them no more. Isn't that awesome? Let's finish there. Next time we'll pick up um, where we're leaving off. Do not despise the chastening of the Lord, which is important. Uh, but let's remember this that we have the assurance that God loves us. So when we're going through difficult times, when we need encouragement, we have the example of Jesus, and we have the assurance that God loves us. And one proof of that is the Word of God, because the Word of God tells us that He loves those whom He disciplines. Father in heaven, again, we do thank you, praise you for your Word. We thank you for allowing us the time this morning to open it, to study on it, to meditate, and to delight in it. And may we be encouraged this morning, knowing that when we go through difficult times, when we go through difficult situations, sometimes it's because you're trying to correct us and bring us back to yourself. So help us to remember that when we are being disciplined by you, it's because you love us. And one proof of that is the Word of God. So we thank you so much for the love that you have for us. We thank you so much that you sent Jesus to die in our place, to be the substitute for our sin. And when we repent and confess our sin, you forgive us and remember it no more. So we praise you for that. So as we leave this place today, may we just leave encouraged, may we leave remembering that Jesus loves us. And so do you, the Father. So thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, if you were able, and close with 185. Jesus loves me, this I know. Before we leave, I just want to close in prayer and bring before the throne of grace and our great physician, our sister Dolly. Um, her surgery is Friday on her shoulder, on her shoulder. So we just want to ask God's blessing on her 
and God's watchful eye on the surgeon and everything else. So let's just go to the throne of grace and then we'll be dismissed. Father in heaven, again, we thank you that we can come boldly before your throne of grace in the time of need. And you tell us we can do that. And this morning we come before your throne with our sister Dolly. Uh, we thank you for her, for her faithfulness to you, to her family, and to the work here at Salem. And Lord, we just pray for her as she has this surgery on her shoulder, that everything go, goes well. We know that she is in your hands. And Lord, we just ask that you would just wrap your, your arms around her. She would feel your peace and your presence. That you would just guide the, the hand of the surgeon. And that everything will go well for your honor, for your glory. And give her a quick recovery, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, folks. Thank you.